All right, welcome to Algebra 2. This is 813, and we're going to be talking about um, stretch factors and polynomial functions today. So we've done these a little bit in the past, but never super specifically. And what we've been covering for a lot in the past few days has been primarily uh, about the x-intercepts and how they cross, right? But what, what, one thing that we should notice is that I can have an infinite number of graphs that cross at those same points in the same ways, and I can get them to be stretched vertically or compressed vertically, and I can still have those same intersections, but have different graphs. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So for 45 here, if I look at these three graphs, right, the first one I'm seeing that I'm crossing at negative 3, 0, and 2. So I would say, well, this is would have the factors of x plus 3, x, and x minus 2. Now that's something that we've been doing for the past few days. should be pretty straightforward and we all kind of get how that works. Um, so the question is, well, how do I know that that is the exact value, right? Because I could have some stretch factor that is in there. Well, if I take this, see this point here um, is at negative 2, 8. If I plug in negative 2 into my equation, it should give me 8 out of it. Likewise, if I plug in positive 1, it, sh it should give me a negative 4 out of it. So that that's one way for me to check. And they're going to give you all these points to kind of have, have you help check that. So let's take a look at B. Uh, on B, I would want to be going through uh, at negative 3. I want to go through z uh, at 0, so that's x. And then I also want to go through at 2. Um, so I would say, well, that's, that's, that's going to be x plus 3 to give me this x to give me this, and x minus 2 to give me that. Now the special thing is on the x, because it's kind of going through at that kind of wiggle, right? Or kind of flattens out as it crosses through. Um, that means it's probably going to be an x to the third and in, in that middle bit. Now the other thing that I want to notice is that, hey, I have this weird end behavior, right? It should be down and up, but it's actually up and down. So that means that there's going to be a negative in front of it. So then again, I can check and say, hey, does this match that exact graph? I can plug in negative uh, 1, and I should get out um, this point here. It looks like it's at 5. Or I could plug in positive 1, and I should get out a positive 5. Or I could plug in a negative 2 and get out negative 30. Okay. So all those points are, are there purely just to kind of show you, hey, here's a point that is nice and pretty for us to check. Um, and that's going to be the stretch factor. And then likewise on C, we can do the same thing. Let's take a look at number 46, though. So this is where we're going to first introduce the stretch factor here. So if I want to say, hey, what's the difference be between this graph and this graph? Go ahead and make a prediction of what they're, of how they're going to look different. And then we're going to go ahead and graph one of these, and we'll check and see how we did. So let me pull this up. So we are graphing. Um, it was x to the second times x minus 3. Oops. Let me get off that line. This times x minus 3 times x plus 1. And then, so that's the A original. Now if I take that same graph, let's put a 3 in front of it, how is it different? Well, all of our x-intercepts are exactly the same. I have one here, I have a double here, and I have one here, which is going to be the same because really I have those same intersections. But the 3 on this blue one is making it a lot taller. So you'll see it's actually 3 times taller at, at, at every single point. So here, 3 times this will put me right here. Uh, if I pick a nice pretty point that I know, so like here's where I'm at um, 1. So if I go straight straight down is where I should be at. Uh, for this one, oh, sorry, here's it at negative 1. Go down here, and here I'm at negative 3. Right? So they're going to be vertically down from each other there. So I'm going to stretch by a factor of 3. So everything is now 3 times taller than it was previously. So that's effectively what is going on with those. Hop back over here. Take a look at our PowerPoint again. So, not too big of a deal there. Now, how do we find what that stretch factor is? So this is the kind of point that, that, that we're looking at now. So here we have the equation. Uh, x plus 3 times x plus 1 times x minus 2 squared. And it gives us this graph here across the there. Negative 3, negative 1, bounces at positive 2. Good, right? But we say, well, what's going to be this stretch factor for it? So there has to be some number in front of it that we're going to be multiplying by in order to make it stretch the right amount for what we need. 
So to figure out what that is, we need some other point which we know. Because if, if, if all I know is the intercepts, I don't know how much it is being stretched. But if, but if I find any other point on it, then I do know how much it is being stretched. So an easy point to, to look for is stuff like the, the uh, y-intercept, if it's going to be going through a nice pretty point. Um, they'll occasionally give you dots to kind of say, hey, here's a nice point, point for you. Or they'll just tell you, like, for, for here, they're going to say, hey, when... Um, it does pass through the point 116, meaning that, hey, when x is 1, y is 16. So let's figure out how, how could we use that to, to make sure we have the right growth or stretch factor there. So let me go ahead and choose, pull up my document camera, and we'll take a look at one of those. Okay, so our problem was uh, y equals x plus 3 to x plus 1 x minus 2 squared. Okay. Now there's some a in front of there that I don't know quite what it is yet. So the point that I do know it crosses through though is the point 1, 16. Well that's my x values and my y values. So let's plug that in for x, that in for y. So 16 equals a times 1 plus 3 times 1 plus 1 times 1 minus 2 squared. All I gotta do is just get a by itself now. So this is just 16 equals a times 4 times 2 times negative 1 squared is just a 1. So that's, so that's 4 times 2 times 1, which is 8. Divide both sides by 8, and I get a equals 2. So once I know that, now I know my actual equation. It would just be y equals 2 times x plus 3, x plus 1 x minus 2 squared. And that's effectively the process that we're looking at today, right? Write out all the factors which we do know, which we've been doing for a few days now. We should, be, we should feel fairly confident doing that. And then I take a point that I, that I know and I can plug it in, find the stretch factor, and then now I have my exact equation for that particular graph. Cool. So let's hop back over here. So uh, if we look at 48, so we're going to Go ahead and try that here from scratch. So, so go ahead, pause the video, run through 48. You don't need, need to worry about the story as much. Here's the uh, graph, and you know it goes through this point. Find the exact e equation for it. Go. All right. So let's try it out and see how we did. So uh, looking at my graph, right, um, I'm seeing that I'm going through 0. I'm going. I'm going through 3 and I'm crossing at 2. So my equation is going to be y equals a, because I don't know what that stretch factor is. Um, and then I'll have x, because I have to go through 0. And then I want x uh, minus 2 squared, because I'm going to be balancing off of 2. And then I want to be going back through 3, so x minus 3. All right. So there's my equation. Now the point that it tells me I have to go through is the point 2.5, negative 0.2. So, putting all that in, I get negative 0.2 equals a times 2.5 times 2.5 minus 2 is just 0.5 squared times 2.5 minus 3 is negative 0.5. So if I do all of this out, right, I'm going to get 2.5 times 0.5 squared times negative 0.5. And I'm getting negative 0.3125. Divide that over. So negative 0.2 divided by that negative 0.3125. And I get 0.64 for A. So now that I know A, Plug it in, y equals 0.64x times x minus 2 squared times x minus 3. And there we go, right? It's kind of ugly because we're dealing with decimals here, but not too bad. All right, back over to this. We're getting there. So last little bit here. 
Uh, on these two for number 49, go ahead and try those out. Uh, and then 50, try that one out as well and see what you get. Right, and then go ahead and come back here and we'll do at least the last little bit of them. Okay, so we're going to take a look. Sorry, I'm going to grab some fresh paper. We're going to take a look at uh, number 50. Because if you can do 50, then you can do all. So, uh, there we go. So we know that we bounce off the x-axis at negative 1, meaning that I have to have y equals a times x plus 1 squared, because I bounce off it. And I cross at 4, which is going to be x minus 4. All right, so that's probably the equation that you came up with. Now I'm also told that I go through the point uh, negative 2, negative 18. So plugging everything in, I get negative 18 equals a times negative 2 plus 1 squared times negative 2 minus 4. So that is negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. Negative 1 squared is just 1. So that's a times 1 times negative 2 minus 4 is negative 6. So, negative, so 1 times negative 6 is just negative 6. And negative 18. Divide both sides by negative 6, and I get that a equals 3. So now we get y equals 3 x plus 1 squared, x minus 4. Awesome. Works out not, not too bad. So once you kind of get that, it's really, really easy. But then let's take a look at number 51. So 51 is saying, well, Armando, who's that kid, right, says, well, he got the equation um, 3 times x plus 1 to the fourth times x minus 4, right, which is different than ours. Ours is x plus 1 squared, right? Does his meet all of the criteria? Well, does it bounce at negative 1? Yeah, because of to the fourth power will will also bounce. Does it cross at 4? Yeah. And then does it meet the criteria? Well, if I plug in uh, a negative 2 in, in for his, let's show you here. If, if I plug in a negative 2 here, and then I got uh, negative 1 to the fourth power as opposed to to the second power, it's still going to be 1, so I would still get 3. So it's be the same thing here, but to the fourth power. So that one would work too, right? What if I had it to the sixth power? That would still work. Eighth power, still work. Any of those would still work, oops, um, no matter what power I use. Now that's a very special case to this one in particular. Don't think of that as a hard set rule by any means. What they're trying to, to show is, hey, even though I had that, there's still a lot of different ways where, where I could get equations for this, right? So, is his wrong? No, right? But is his the most simple form? No, right? This is why you're going to often see a qualifier statement, which is a statement which just kind of uh, reduces the options down to the best one, right? Um, of saying things like, hey, we want the polynomial of the least degree possible, which still meets the given criteria, right? Because his polynomial is a fifth degree polynomial, whereas ours was a third degree polynomial. So there's no benefit in making things more complex unless you have a reason to it. So we will always, always, always shoot for the smallest degree possible, which is why we've talked about the degrees quite a bit the past few days here. All right. Uh, so with that, we're going to go ahead and skip 52. It's just taking that same idea and saying, hey, we need more points in order to make sure that only one of them works. Um, so, uh, note-wise, uh, general e equation for polynomials, you likely know what this is, even though you may not have only talked a about it. Um, what that is, is we typically write x to, to the largest power, and then in descending order down for uh, powers of x down to the constant term. So if I had x to the fifth, then x to the fourth, x to the third, x to the second, x, and then constant. You always do it in that order, because then it's really easy for anybody to look at it and know what the largest power is because the degree of that, poly, the, of that polynomial is so important, we want to be able to find that very, very easily for us. So, just kind of whenever you write a polynomial, always put it in that order as a general rule. Um, and then a little uh, closure here. Uh, what information about the graph of a polynomial function is necessary to determine exactly one correct equation? So you need to, to know what its intercepts are 
and how it intercepts them. And then you need at least one other point, assuming you were looking for the smallest degree possible. If, you, if you're not looking for the smallest degree possible, then you need um, additional points in order to reduce that, that down to a singular one. But that's again why we typically just say, give us the smallest degree possible. All right, with that, here is our homework, uh, 54 through 62, and I will talk to you guys next time.